Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, um, and thank you to um, Abhishek and all the staff at MAP for such a warm welcome. And I, I'm so impressed with this institution. It's a real addition to uh, the cultural life of Bangalore. Um, so I've been involved with Indian art and traveled to the subcontinent um, for a very long time, many decades. I first came to India in 1980, and uh, I've noticed quite significant changes over, over the years. And uh, I haven't actually been to Bangalore for about 30 years, but um, I can see all the changes that have happened. And um, there's an awful lot going on here, which is, which is great, mostly great. Some slightly strange buildings appearing here and there, but um, this is one of the most distinguished, I think, of the new um, buildings that have appeared. Well, there's a huge variety of art forms uh, that you can find on the Indian subcontinent, of course, and many of them are represented here. Painting, sculpture, metalwork, textiles, and architecture. But there's very little awareness of the ceramic tile tradition. Um, and this is something which um, I dimly became aware of when I started looking at tiles generally. I was working, first of all, on my first book, um, which was on Syrian tiles, but I was aware of uh, the Mughal tiles, a small collection of which uh, are on view in the gallery in the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, the distinctive warm tones, you can see an example here, and then these two, which are in the Victorian Albert Museum in the, in the Indian galleries. Um, very distinctive and very unlike, really, in the... In the um, uh, colors used, the tiles that you see elsewhere, um, in mostly in the Islamic world, Persia, Central Asia, um, and quite naturalistic floral forms um, in the painting. But what I didn't realize at the time was that the tiles on view in the Victoria and Albert Museum are really just the tip of the iceberg. And um, these two tiles are typical examples, and in fact, the great majority of tiles in the museum's collection are from just two buildings. Um, on the left, we've got a tile which came from the Asaf Khan tomb in Lahore. Um, and on the right, we've got um, a an, um, floral tile from the famous mosque and tomb of Madani in Srinagar, both dated around 1645. And the tiles from these two monuments completely dominate the collection in the museum. And I think it just shows how it is possible for museums perhaps sometimes to give a misleading impression of uh, the totality of, um, uh, of uh, particular art forms because these tiles were available in the 19th century. They were being sold to British visitors and um, also they're obviously visually appealing, perhaps in a way that some of the other tiles weren't. So the, the museum ended up with, with a very limited range of tiles. Um, there are, of course, a lot more in storage, but, um, but many of them still come from these two monuments. So I, in a way, one's got to be a little bit um, aware that museums can direct your train of thought to um, what they choose to display. So I found this quite interesting to see these tiles and wanted to know more about it and started investigating the subject. And what I'm hoping to do today is just give you an idea of the huge variety of um, glazed ceramics from the subcontinent, um, all the different architectural contexts, techniques, designs, and colors that you can see, and the, the great range of um, different places all the way across the subcontinent and the different patrons who were involved in commissioning, um, commissioning these uh, decorations. So how do we define um, Indian tiles or in tiles from the Indian subcontinent? I think we probably most of us think of um, a square glazed ceramic cladding on the wall, but um, there are many different types, of course. Um, in the context of the Indian subcontinent, we're talking about um, uh, glazed ceramics produced roughly between the 14th and the 18th century. So we get wall decorations, 
but there are also tiles that went on roofs. I'm not talking about the plain terracotta um, roof tiles that you see everywhere, of course. I'm, I'm focusing tonight just on glazed ceramics. Um, but you also get floor tiles and other types of glazed architectural elements. Um, some of them structural, such as here, um, you can see some glazed bricks in Bengal. Both of these um, images are from Bengal. Um, we've got um, on the left um, a detail from the Latan Mosque, um, which we'll talk about more in a minute. And then on the right, um, a false window. It's shaped like a window on the side of the Gumpti Gate um, in Gore. These are both in Gore, in fact. Um, and they both date from um, around the end of the 15th century. And you get, um, you get tiles inside and outside, and floor tiles, roof tiles. But um, the great majority we'll be talking about today are on walls. So why do we see tiles? Um, they obviously, in the Western context, um, we see them as a sort of practical object. But um, I think in the South Asian context, we're thinking mostly of the decorative aspect, um, particularly the non-fading colors, because um, ceramic glazes don't fade. And so they're ideal for in the blazing um, Indian sunshine. Um, they keep their color. Um, they do, unfortunately, weather, as you'll see quite a bit um, later on. But um, they do have a, have a particular quality which um, you don't get with painting of, of um, enduring colors. There's also the matter of fashion, because um, it has to be said that glazed tiles are not um, a, an indigenous art form to India. They were um, first seen elsewhere, um, Anatolia, Iran, and Central Asia. And I think there is a sense that this was a, this was a style which um, there was a desire to emulate in India, amongst, particularly amongst the, the new Muslim rulers who came in from the 13th century onwards. Um, just looking at some examples now of other wall tiles, these are some rather nice ones on the tomb of Ibrahim Qutb Shah in Golconda, dating from about 1580. And these are mosaic tiles. We'll be talking a little bit more about the technique in a minute. But um, quite a rarity are these glazed roof tiles in Fatipur Sikri, which um, people don't really tend to notice because everybody thinks of the warm red sandstone and the, um, and the carving. But um, up on the roof of um, um, the palace of Jodhbai, um, from the time of Akbar, of course, 1572, are these very unusual glazed tiles which give a slight sense of um, North Africa, in a way. Um, glazed roof tiles are not really that common in India at all anyway. Even on the domes of mosques and tombs, they do appear, but in quite a limited way. So it's definitely not the main, um, the main type of uh, glazed ceramic that you see. And it's interesting in this context that um, in Hermayan's tomb in Delhi, um, there are glazed um, roof um, tiles on the domes, but not the main dome, which of course is clad in marble, but they're on the subsidiary um, tiles, uh, subsidiary um, chattery domes. Um, so they were obviously not considered um, sort of totally mainstream. Floor tiles are also relatively rare in, in India. Um, these are two examples from Gur in Bengal. Um, a fragment of rather a nice scale pattern in the royal palace um, in the center of the site. Um, and, um, and then a restored patch of tiles in the Latan Mosque, which was um, the mosque that has the glazed bricks we were looking at earlier on. These both date from around 1500. Um, in some of the great tombs of uh, Multan, now in Pakistan, uh, you do see um, quite often um, glazed floor tiles, but the trouble with um, tiles from the Indus region is that it's a continuing tradition, and 
it's very difficult to tell what's old and what's new. And they do tend to wear. So um, it's very likely that the floor tiles are 19th century, if not 20th century. Um, but I think you can still deduce from that that um, tiles were used in that architectural context of flooring. So the earliest type of tile that you might see in the subcontinent are monochrome, plain tiles, just one color, um, most commonly cobalt blue. But you can see here um, an example. This is the Shish Gumbad in Delhi, about 1490 in date. And um, there's a little bit of turquoise as well, which um, is the other most common color on the earlier tiled monuments. Um, quite a restrained use of, of tiling. And um, in these early buildings, it was really just a sort of emphasis on the building rather than um, an extensive decoration. These are on a little visited monument in the Punjab, um, Talanian. Um, they stand out very brilliantly against the brickwork. But of course, we do have to remember that the um, you can see traces of plaster stucco here, and um, they were probably painted originally. So the, the blue wouldn't have been quite as stark against the background. Um, here we've got both square tiles um, lined with those little fillets of tile, rather like the building we were just looking at in Delhi, um, but also glazed bricks which, again, the bricks are not entirely glazed, but um, there's just a sort of line of blue to, um, to provide a bit of architectural emphasis. So square blue tiles and glazed bricks are one thing, but um, quite quickly there was a need to bring in a little bit of variety to the tiles. And um, it, an obvious thing, particularly in the Indian context, was cutting because, of course, the skills of the, um, the local craftsmen were primarily cutting uh, stone masonry and, and um, carving, obviously sculpture, but also um, just decorative carving. So it came very naturally to start carving tiles. Um, on the left, we've got um, just an example of a cut tile in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And on the right, um, the tomb of Sheikh Yusuf Katal, 1526, which um, gives you an idea of the sort of context for these tiles. They're um, just usually just one color and cut to shape and just a sort of addition to the um, architecture, which is primarily in carved stone. And it's interesting too, on the next, um, this is the the outer gate um, to the fort at Agra from Akbar period. Um, and we've got inlay. You can see on the right the detail of the um, decorative inlay. And I think most people would feel that that is white marble with a bit of blue glaze um, detailing um, forming the borders. But in fact, when you get up close to these, you realize that they're white glaze ceramic. And um, it's not immediately clear why um, white ceramic would have been used in Agra, of all places, where marble is king. But um, it's quite interesting that you know, they decided to do that. So you do, during this Akbar period, um, you, you do get um, uh, small amounts of um, tile inlay um, to decorate the walls. But it's very much one of many types of inlay, the, the glazed ceramic. As well as cutting tiles into different shapes to inlay in the stone, um, there's another technique which is very little understood, which um, this is unfortunately quite an old photograph um, taken in Orcha. And there's a very good reason why it's an old photograph, because very sadly, a lot of the, this decoration has now gone. The whole of the left portion of, the, um, of this uh, frieze has now disappeared. But it's, it's quite an unusual technique, not much seen even outside India. Um, across the Islamic world, you don't really see it very much. It's, where, it's called engraving, and it's, it's where a square tile has been 
carved on the surface. The glaze has been carved away to leave um, the pattern in blue. So the effect is similar to a shaped tile, but it's all actually a series of square tiles which show this rather charming, slightly folkish frieze um, with various animals. You can see a pair of birds on the left and then a lion further to the right and a tree. Um, this is just quite a small patch, but I expect there was a lot more of it originally. And probably these plain tiles um, to either side are replacements which um, um, have replaced a much longer continuous freeze. This is on the parapet of the Jehangir Mahal in Orcha, um, which dates from around 1610. Um, this is not a very common technique, but you do see it in um, Gwalior and one or two other places, but um, it's used to a much lesser extent in Delhi, as we'll see in a minute. The other way of um, using tiles that have been cut is this um, sort of geometrical inlay. And of course, um, you can use different colors side by side. And um, this became increasingly popular in the um, period of Jehangir. This is um, the Fatehabad Sarai in Punjab, about 1606 in date. And um, you can see it's quite a a sort of typical Islamic design, which um, would be very familiar to people in, um, in the Selchuk world in Anatolia. But the difference here is the color. And I think this being India, um, lots of colors um, very quickly um, kick in and um, become ubiquitous on, on these buildings. I think the, um, the Sarai's, a whole series of um, I suppose the early equivalent of motels dotted along the trunk road between Lahore and Delhi and, and on to Agra um, were um, they're very little visited and they're really rather nice places because they're nowadays a big courtyard with a garden and then just gates arranged around very nice peaceful parks and they do have some of the best preserved tile work um, in that part of India. But the most popular type of tile work that you see um, in, the, in the Mughal period is mosaic, cut tile mosaic, which um, unlike the, tile, the slide we've just seen, the, the colors are not separated. They're put right up next to each other. The tiles are cut and then fitted together like a jigsaw. And um, this is the, um, um, the Kerul Manazil Mosque in, uh, near the Purana Kila in Delhi. Um, and it's just from the beginning of Akbar period. And you can see that we've got tiled mosaic around the archway of the Mirab and these borders as well. But it's combined with carved stucco work. And also, we do have a little bit of engraving that I was talking about earlier on. You can see the flowers um, on those borders have been scooped out. Um, and, um, and they were never filled with anything. They, they were just, um, it was the intention to show the natural color of the ceramic body underneath. And then you've got further carving above on those, um, the merlons at the top. Um, but the great thing about um, uh, mosaic tiles is that each piece each color was still a monochrome piece which could be fired separately. So it meant that you'd always get the very best color in the, in the firing um, because the problem with um, polychrome painted tiles is that it's all fired together. And so you're not always necessarily getting the right firing temperature for the um, individual color. So it's a bit of a compromise. They have other advantages which we'll talk about a, a bit more in a minute. But the real um, zenith of craftsmanship in terms of cut tile mosaic is during the reign of Shah Jahan. Um, this is another Sarai near Amritsar, the Amanat Khan Sarai, dated 1641. Um, and, and you can see here, again, the sort of glorious colors and designs, quite sort of formal, but also a hint of naturalism as well in the decoration. And um, not a, a lot of 
earlier, um, people who studied tiles um, had always assumed that these pieces were placed into the, straight onto the wall. Um, that actually would have been quite difficult to do um, because getting the accurate fit with the mortar drying as you do it and cutting them all to shape on the spot would be quite a task. And in fact, research not in India but in Iran has shown that in fact the way they did it was um, they laid them out face down on the ground um, and placed onto a drawing of the pattern and then they made panels um, roughly two foot square um, and then packed on the um, mortar behind and then placed them on the wall like huge tiles in e each section at a time. And of course, that sounds rather a fiddle, but in fact, it was a much easier and more effective way of, um, of making sure the end result was the very best. This is um, obviously much weathered now, but it's, um, it's, it's one of, one of the most interesting tile buildings, the Chinika Rausa in Agra, the tomb of Afzal Khan, who was actually the brother of Amanat Khan, um, who built the Sarai we were just looking at. Um, it's quite interesting to see with the weathering, actually, because first of all, you can see more clearly the, um, the division lines and how the ceramic has been cut. But also it's interesting that the um, some of the colors have weathered better than others. And you can see here the blue um, has survived much better than any of the other colors. Um, it's sadly not much visited. Uh, obviously, in Agra, the Taj Mahal um, steals all the thunder. And, um, and this is in a sort of much less visited part of the town. But I mean, I do recommend it very strongly if um, some of you have never been before. Um, and um, it, Another thing that's quite interesting about it is architecturally, it's very simple, lots of flat surfaces, um, apart from these gentle pilasters um, at intervals. But all the, all the sort of architecture is subsumed to the, um, the, the, the um, 2D design of the, of the tile work. Um, and it's, it, there's still quite a lot there that, um, um, that, that's still here today. But as I say, it's not very much visited, and um, it's um, quite different from the crowds you get around the Taj Mahal. But I think talking about um, mosaic, cut tile mosaic in India, the very greatest um, example is also remarkably little visited, um, and, but it's very well preserved because most of the tiles are indoors, and it's in a sort of working um, religious building, um, the, um, the, the Ashokana in Hyderabad, and the tiles are slightly later than the building, but only by a few decades, probably about 1610. But the precision of the cutting, you can see on the left a detail, um, I mean, it really is quite remarkable, and the richness of colour, um, and um, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised that this is what I wanted to have for the front cover of my book, because um, it really is quite splendid, but again, very, very little visited. Um, in fact, the taxi driver in Hyderabad didn't, hadn't heard of it and didn't know where it was. Um, so I've talked about um, cut tile mosaic, and the crucial thing about it is that the, the tiles are fired first and then cut, because then it's hard and you can get a very precise edge um, that can then fit together nicely. But there is another way of doing it, which of course is quicker and cheaper, um, which you do see um, particularly in the Indus region. Um, and, you, and of course that is cutting the clay while it's soft and then glazing it and then firing it as an individual object and then placing it together. But you can see immediately the drawbacks of this, um, which is that the, the pieces don't fit nearly so well. This is quite a late um, example. This is the, from the, um, the shrine of Shabazz Kalanda in Sewan, and the tiles are probably early 20th century, but still they're um, very much in the traditional style, and they could easily be 100 or 200 years earlier, um, and they do illustrate the point of the um, um, cutting before firing, and um, you can see very clearly the difference. These are also the local type from that region of, of um, slip glazed tiles, which you don't see 
so much in India, but you, the Sindh potters who came to Mumbai in the 19th century, um, the Bombay School of Art pottery um, very much uses this sort of slip painted technique. So I want to talk a little bit more specifically now about painted tiles, which of course is the, is the other, um, other major category of tile work in India. Um, obviously, practically speaking, there are lots of advantages from um, using painted tiles. It's quicker. Um, it gives more freedom for the artist to paint the design rather than um, being constrained by the, the limits of, of um, the tile cutter. And also, the tiles can be repeated in squares because um, the design doesn't necessarily need to follow the shape of the tile. So um, it's much easier to actually produce the physical tile. And the disadvantage, as I mentioned, is although the colors are pretty splendid here, um, it's much less, um, mu much more difficult to, to achieve those very, uh, those very brilliant, bright colors that you see on the cut tile mosaic. This is in a technique um, which um, is represented by those two tiles I showed at the beginning um, in the Victoria and Albert Museum called Quer de Seca, which literally means dry cord, and it's seen um, in other parts of the world. But um, the key thing about it is that the colors are, are hemmed in by a black line um, and lots of people prefer to call it black line um, decoration, but you can see the, um, the yellows and the greens are kept separate by this resistant um, line made of um, a manganese oxide, and it stops the colors merging together. But very unusually, and only in India, this technique is also mixed with um, a bit of sort of shading which gives a sense of depth, and you can see the colors are not all separated by black lines. The, the big flower, the white flower, um, details are actually painted on a single color. And you can see this sort of shading effect on, on the petals of the other flowers, um, which um, gives it a sense of, of depth and makes it a bit more like a proper painting rather than just a decorative pattern. And um, the equivalence in Quer de Seca technique that you see in um, other parts of the world, such as Iran and Central Asia, don't really have this extra dimension. So I think that makes um, that's something very unique about um, the Quer de Seca tiles produced. These are mostly um, Shah Jahan period. These, this tile particularly is also one of the type that comes from Srinagar, at the tomb of Madani. This is also um, Quer de Seca, and this is actually much closer in colors and, um, and the way it's painted much more simply, quite crisply, um, much more related to Persian um, glazed tiles. Um, again, Quer de Seca technique, we can see the black outline, um, that the colors are clearly separated, and there isn't any shading here. Um, we don't know who the tile makers were. This is at Dartia, the Govind Mahal um, in, in, in Dartia, um, again 17th century. But um, it's, um, it's actually remarkably close to the, um, the, the tiles that you see, certainly in terms of color, um, during the Safavid period in Iran. Um, but really very nice, obviously, again, slightly weathered. That's one of the best um, surviving complete tiles. Um, about 1620. This is an, another group of tiles on the same building in Dartia, um, some other patterns. Um, I had to photograph this from quite a distance, so the, um, the definition's gone slightly. But again, Quer de Seca technique um, outlined in dark, um, dark black lines. And then over there, we've got some other patterns as well. Um, very, very fragmentary now. And also, combined, as you often see during this period, with um, painted decoration as well. The painting is um, on the lower tier and a bit more protected from the elements. And just to show you, um, just to show you the comparison, this is um, an, from the Ottoman um, green uh, tomb in Bursa, 
um, about 100 years earlier than the um, examples we were looking at. Uh, in fact, 200 years earlier than the last one, um, 1421. Um, quite a sort of formal design, but this is, this is one of the, the sort of prototypes, I suppose you might say, for the um, Cuer de Seca technique. Um, and they're, again, s mostly square or, or reduced square tiles um, that have been painted. And you can see the colors are actually remarkably similar to the, um, the, Dartia, the first of the Dartia tiles we saw. But Cuer de Seca is only one technique, and it made quite a brief appearance in India. And there aren't very few examples still to be seen on the buildings. Um, but a variation which is quite similar is what you see in Bengal, um, which is basically just the same, but without the black line, and allowing the colors to sort of mingle a little bit more. Um, and you'd just call this color glaze decoration. This is a, a Merlon tile um, from, it's in the, um, actually this one's in a private collection. There are quite a few examples in museums from Gore. Again, it's, um, it, it's probably around 1500 in date. And the colors have blended a little bit, but um, it gives the overall a little more, slightly more spontaneous, um, maybe folkish effect. And um, the, the technical quality is not quite the same, but um, nevertheless, they're very, very sort of charming tiles and, um, and, and they've got great appeal, actually. Um, again, a lot of the glaze has been lost now in, in um, the, the buildings in Bengal, but um, it's very nice when you've got an example like this that you can really examine closely. So we've had a quick look at the different techniques of tiles, and I want now just to focus a bit more on how they're used in architecture. Um, so let's just go back. Um, So there's, I'm sorry, there's one, other, yes, there's one other technique which I nearly missed, which is um, underglaze painting, which is the technique that you'd see on Chinese porcelain. This is probably the most favored with um, uh, tile um, painters and artists because it's the closest you get to um, the situation an artist has with a white canvas and you just paint on it. Um, it's on a white slip, primarily with um, blue and other colored oxides. Um, and this is one of the finest examples of this technique um, in the subcontinent um, at Ashtor outside Bidar. Bidar really is an amazing place to visit if any of you have not yet been there. But um, again, remarkably little visited, but um, it's got some superb monuments and some of the finest quality underglaze painted tiles you'll see anywhere in, the, in, in, in India. Um, you can see the very crisp designs. These were, um, these were produced in the mid 15th century, so they're quite early as well. And Persian craftsmen were brought in um, by the Bahmanis, and um, it's very likely at least the, that these tiles the decoration was supervised by um, Persian master craftsmen. And in fact, they have signed their names on some of the other um, monuments in the, in the area. Quite a, um, quite a Timurid-influenced um, design as well, very close to the sort of decoration you might see in um, places like Herat. Um, the main place today, other than um, the fine examples in Bidar, where you'd probably see this underglaze painted technique, is in the Indus region. And um, these are two examples from the 18th century in Sindh. Um, on the left, we've got the, um, the Durga of, um, of Abdul Latif in Bitshar. And on the right, um, the, um, one, one of the tombs in Multan. Um, and um, you can see, again, get a sense of the flexibility which um, this technique gives the artist. Um, you, can, um, you can paint any design and they're produced quite quickly. It's, it's quite, um, uh, it's good that these two buildings, we know that the tiles are 18th century, but a lot of the earlier monuments, of course, the tiles have been replaced, but most of these um, are pretty much as they were in the 18th century. 
Some of the designs um, are, are obviously quite mogul, um, and other design, mogul influenced at least, and um, other, other designs such as the geometric border you've got um, on the slide on the right um, are probably much earlier designs that have been reproduced over the centuries. So um, I want to just focus a little bit more now on how tiles are used in architecture. And as I said at the beginning, um, the earliest buildings were very, very sparing the way tiles were used. This is quite possibly uh, the earliest tile building in India. Um, it's the Idgar at Rapri, which is not far from Agra, dated 1312. So it is extremely early. And I think what's interesting here is the tiles are clearly not serving any practical function at all. They're, um, they're very much a visual thing to give the building a bit of outline and um, very sort of minimal use of glazing, but just to, um, just to give the building a little bit of emphasis. And this is something we see in Multan as well, um, a little bit more elaborate, but again, as I was saying, you can't be sure these tiles are all um, probably almost all quite a bit later replacements. But again, just generally as a point, the use of tiles is quite restrained and mixed with this lots of um, undecorated brick showing um, or carved brick. But, um, but, but the, the glazing is just minimally used to give the building a little bit of emphasis. The same sort of thing we can see at Mandu on the um, mid-15th century monuments. Um, the, um, the glazing here is used um, to, to give a bit of form to otherwise flat surfaces. And I think it's not fanciful to think of the blue here as um, indicating the sky beyond a battlement. You can see above the Merab um, the, um, the, the sort of little um, triangles of, of blue, which, um, which, which you could imagine a sort of view out to beyond battlements. And, and you've got those square shapes below, which are, or cross shapes below, which are, of course, the archers' um, spy holes to, um, to fire arrows through. Um, if it had been a real military battlement. And on the right, um, the Mosque of Malik Mugis, um, which we've got a sort of jarly window effect. Um, and um, again, we can sort of imagine a pierced screen with the sky showing through in the background. And most familiar of all, of course, is the um, Man Mandir at Gwalior, um, with the false battlements, but lots of other things um, going on here, and a very bold decoration making a real statement. And this is probably um, probably the most famous, of course, uh, tile building in India. And I think if most people are thinking about Indian tiles, this would be the first building they would think of. But um, this, is, this was um, influenced by... Um, probably by the, the tile work we were just looking at in Mandu, um, which is probably about 50 years earlier than this. Um, but it gives, you, um, it gives you a sense of, of the sort of adventurousness or, and, and the, the idea of making tiles that can be seen from a great distance. And this is taken, to, um, um, taken a little bit further in the wall at the fort in Lahore, um, and it is known that the Mughal emperors um, were very aware of Gwalior and, um, and, and were impressed with it. And I think they probably had it at the back of their mind when they were um, putting together the picture wall, um, which um, is not just decorative tiles, but it includes painting. And, um, and, and also um, there's a little bit of texture as well. You can see the carving along the the top frieze with a geometric design. But most interesting of all, of course, and most, um, which draws most people's attention, um, are these panels um, loosely modeled on Indian miniature painting. And um, they're very charming scenes, but quite, you know, when you get up close, you see they're quite, not very, not sort of very detailed, but they're 
the important thing is that you can see it from a distance. And it gives you this idea of strolling around a picture gallery um, and looking at, um, looking at all these scenes which are mixed in. So it's a sort of, um, sort of architectural equivalent of looking through an album of miniatures um, and, and enjoying all the scenes. Going back to Bidar, um, you can see another bold color statement um, on the outside of a building. Um, this is the Madrasa of Mahmud Gawan um, from 1472. And it's again got some of the most amazing um, colored tiles. And only on the front of the building, um, on the facade, probably as much as anything because of cost, but also the idea um, with these, this type of building, that it's all about the facade. This, of course, is only half of the building because um, it, um, it, it blew up in an explosion, um, I think, about 100 years later. I can't quite remember the exact date. But, um, so this is just one side of it. But you can really get an idea of what it must have been like when it was completely covered in tiles because you can see right down to the bottom of the building the outline of, of tiles. And also, unusually, there are two different techniques at work. You've got the mosaic tiles with the um, inscription frieze at the top. And then lower down in the spandrels of that arch in the image on the right, we've got underglaze painted tiles um, like the ones on the tomb that we were looking at a minute ago. And I was talking about painted tiles um, being a bit limiting in a way uh, because of the single firing with different colors. They got round this problem um, part of the way in Bidar with, <clears throat> on that, you can't really see very easily there, but there are some little yellow bits um, around that archway, and um, they've been separately fired, cut to shape, and inserted in the painted tiles, because obviously the firing of the yellow must have been a bit of a problem. And, um, and so, um, so to get the very best tone of yellow, um, they, um, they fired separate pieces and slotted them in. Well, this, at first sight, seems like a sort of very worn out building, but um, you, you have to really look at it to imagine just how extraordinary. This is the Latam Mosque again in Gur, in Bengal, and every single bit of it is or was glazed. And we've got these wonderful glazed bricks on this end of the building, on the, on the western side. And, um, um, and the, all the surface, I mean, the bits that aren't glazed are just simply worn away, but it was totally glazed. And then inside as well, um, you've got these wonderful um, glazed bricks in much lighter colors, obviously, to because um, it's quite a... I mean, there aren't many windows in the building, and um, giving, giving a sort of impression of lightness inside. Um, it really is the most extraordinary building. And then, of course, we've got the floor tiles, which um, we were looking at earlier on. So um, even though it's worn today, it's the most extraordinary place. There's one building... Um, this is um, the tomb of Asaf Khan in Lahore, which I mentioned quite a lot of the tiles in the Victorian Albert Museum come from. Um, and I think an interesting thing here is that you've got two techniques side by side, and for a very practical, sensible reason. Um, you've got, on the lower portion of the vertical part of the wall, you've got painted Quer de Seca tiles, um, very much the type we were looking at a minute ago. And then above, where you've got the very complex soffit of the arch um, with lots of different angles. Obviously, flat painted tiles wouldn't have really um, worked very successfully. So the, um, the designer switched to mosaic tiles. And um, so you've got the two stars side by side, which is slightly odd in a way because they do have a very different effect. But um, nevertheless, it's very, it's very practical. Um, and you can see also that the, the white um, divisions between the panels of tiles, um, which are, are replicating marble, they are also um, just white glazed ceramic tiles. Um, a rather sad footnote to this is um, you'll quickly see these are the same views, 
um, 20 or 30 years apart, and you can see how greatly the, um, the buildings deteriorated in the more recent photograph on the left. Um, that photograph on the right was taken in the mid-1980s, so not so long ago, um, but there's been huge losses since then. And we're go going to come on to that in a minute. But I just wanted to talk also about um, other architectural uses of tiles. Um, the dado, which is a very common architectural feature in um, architecture around the world, basically a lower portion of a wall, um, treated separately largely for practical reasons because of the wear um, of, 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 of um, people walking past. This is the tomb of Jehangir in Lahore, and um, you can see, um, you can just imagine streams of pilgrims coming to see the tomb, brushing past, and it made perfectly good sense to um, cover the surface in glazing. Meanwhile, up above, um, the less worn, wearable areas um, are, are painted, and of course, painting is much cheaper and easier to do and um, much more flexible too for the artist. So um, there'd be a definite preference for painting where possible. But, um, but the tiles were used here perhaps in a more practical way than you would see on some of the other buildings we've looked at. And um, there are some similar ones in this very unusual group of tiles um, in Aurangabad, the Bibi Kamakbara um, from Aurangzeb's time. Um, and um, there are really no other tiles like this in the whole of India, and um, so they're really totally unique. They're only in the gateway leading onto the garden, and perhaps these rose bushes here give one a sense of what's to come in the ornamental garden people are just about to walk into. And I suppose the gateway was quite a busy area with people gathering. Um, and so, again, there's a practical sense to um, protecting the walls from too much wear and tear. Um, but these, the way these are painted with the white ground and the... Um, I mean, obviously, the rose bushes, the style of it is familiar, and you might well see designs like this on um, cotton textiles, but um, they're, they're, as ceramic tiles, they're very, very unusual. Um, and beautifully painted as well. And then these rather nice green scrolling borders as well. And then the last example of this sort of thing is Goa. And then these are rather, it's, there isn't really time to go into um, the fascination of these tiles in Goa, which again are totally unique. This is in the convent of Santa Monica, um, again, early 17th century. But the tiles are thought to be quite a bit earlier, and certainly in technique, um, they're on red clay. They're very much the Indus Valley sinned type of tile, and almost certainly they were produced there. Um, and one of the theories is that they were um, booty when the, the Portuguese actually sacked Tata in Sindh in the mid 16th century, and it may well be that um, this is a group of tiles which were. Um, stolen from a, a workshop, perhaps, in Sindh at the time. And there were, um, none survived today, but there were similar tiles in one of the churches in Vasai, just north of Mumbai, which, of course, also was a Portuguese settlement. And um, so uh, this, the, these tiles, um, Portuguese obviously are famous for their tiles, and there are Portuguese-made tiles on um, the nearby church of St. Augustine, but, um, but these are clearly locally made, or at least made in the subcontinent. Um, but the full story about, about them is still really to be told. But, um, but they're, again, very unique and very interesting. The one on the right is in a, um, an American collection, but there are obviously the tiles in the convent, and there are some others in the Museum of Tiles in Lisbon. So, finally, um, the, um, the subtitle to um, the talk was A Vanishing Legacy. And, I mean, I don't want to be too gloomy, but it is 
um, it is obviously a very threatened art form, and there are lots of reasons for this. Um, I mean, there's not much we can do about the weather um, raining onto, you know, the extreme weather that you get, which, of course, erodes the tiles. Um, and vandalism and theft um, is another problem, which um, is probably improving a little bit because a lot of these monuments are much better protected than they were. But I think the most serious threat is um, what's often quite well-meaning um, restoration, inappropriate restoration of buildings. This is the um, tomb of um, uh, Ali Mir Tijara in Hansi in Haryana. Um, and this photograph was taken in 2008. And you can see um, really quite a lot of quite nice colors here. The building was very run down looking, as you can see, and people living in it. Um, so it needed a little bit of attention. Um, but when um, we arrived to look at the building, which I was very eager to see um, in 2018, we saw the finishing touches being, <laughs> being put together. They were still um, finishing off with the ladder there. And white, the dreaded white paint splashed all over the place. And a lot of the tiles painted over, not all of them, but, um, but rather a sorry sight, actually. And, um, you know, the building, I'm sure, um, you know, now will survive much longer. But um, I just, you know, we just wish that somehow it could have been done in a slightly more sensitive manner, um, respecting the decorations. But um, this is... You know, this, this is, it is a difficult problem because, you know, we're obviously, we want the buildings to be protected and repaired, but it's just got to be done in the right way. And another case is um, the uh, sh Sufi shrine of Bakhtiar Khaki in the south of Delhi, um, which um, th this photograph was taken about 30 years ago near the Kutub Minar. And again, some extremely interesting and very unique tiles. Um, you can see a small patch there on the right, sort of ogival-shaped tiles in yellow and green, decorated in the Quer de Seca technique, um, which were still visible um, at this time, 30 years ago. And there were also, um, you can just see behind the shrine, um, some mosaic tiles from a slightly earlier period, um, probably um, mid-16th century, um, quite like the, um, the, some of those early Sultanate uh, or early Mughal tiles in, in Delhi um, that we were looking at earlier on. But um, just a small patch around the um, ablution niche behind this, um, this pavilion. And also you can see at the bottom just the remains of a very beautiful trio of flowers in an old um, Quer de Seca painted dado. Um, so, you know, the, the quite, quite an interesting and unique site for tiles. And I'll just show you a close up of um, these, which luckily were extensively photographed by the scholar Mark Zabrowski um, um, in around late 80s, I think. Um, and I was very fortunate to get access to all his slide collection. He sadly died quite a long time ago. Um, but um, these are, um, you know, a very sad loss because today, uh, and this is, this is the other a detail of the other niche as it was with the earlier tiles. Um, again, totally unique. You can see some hexagonal tiles with the engraved technique. They've been scooped away, um, just leaving colored circles, which um, you don't see anywhere else, and some engraved tile spandrels at the top. And then this um, dado at the bottom is modeled on a, um, on a Timurid building in, um, in Iran. Um, but again, a much more colorful example than the ones in Iran, but beautiful really. But today, um, all we've got is this mirror glass stuck onto the tiles. And I'm hoping that underneath this bit of whitewashed wall, there are still some tiles. I like to think I can just see some colors shining through lower down, but I'm not so sure. But it's all gone, really, and all, all that we're left with now is the tile spandrels on the right. So, um, you know, these buildings need to be protected. I think that these, th these monuments we've seen, they're not under the protection of the ASI, so, um, so things are a little bit more precarious. But um, 
that's the end of my talk for tonight, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arthur, for the wonderful talk. Uh, now we have some time for questions, if anyone would. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, quite enjoyed it. Um, my question was regarding the base material of the tiles. Um, were they all terracotta or was there different types of clay used? Well, that's a good point, actually. And I was going to go into a bit of detail about that, but I didn't want to sort of bring in too many different issues. But um, the, the earliest tiles in, um, in the subcontinent are just red terracotta. Um, and during the Sultanate period, around the Delhi region, um, you start to see this new material which was introduced um, in, uh, well, it goes right back to ancient Egypt, in fact, known as fritware, um, which is a sort of composition material. It's like a very crude form of glass, but it looks like cement. And um, it's basically sort of compacted um, sand, quartz-based, and it's got very little clay in it. And a lot of the tiles um, in the subcontinent are made of that material, but not all. Um, in the Indus region, and also in Bengal, they stayed with the terracotta all the way through. And in other parts of the country, Quer de Seca tiles tend to be red terracotta, and I think that's probably to do with the sort of firing temperatures, because um, the uh, fritware is, is fired at a slightly higher temperature. But a lot of the mosaic tiles um, from the Mughal period are made of fritware. But um, you see both in, in, in India. Uh, thank you so much. Um, love the talk. Thanks for that. Um, I had a question about whether you can give us an example of somewhere the restoration has Um, if you have an example of somewhere the restoration has been done successfully or you think it's yes, actually yes. worked out? Um, there's a lot of work. Um, the Aga Khan Foundation is doing a lot of work in Delhi. Um, and the, um, the, the, I don't know if any of you know the um, Sabs Burj in the middle of a roundabout outside the Humayun's tomb entrance. Um, that's recently been restored very successfully. Um, and it... Um, just been completed, but I've seen some pictures of it, and uh, it's, it's been very well done. Um, it's a little bit of a shock with restoration, because you get these very bright colored tiles on old buildings, and um, it doesn't always feel entirely right, but of course they have been very carefully researched, and, and one's just got to remember that the whole building did look like that once, um, but it's a bit of a shock after you're used to the old um, weathered monuments. and. Um, Another place I thought it was a bit um, jarring is some of the other, the, um, Hermione's tomb, for example, the, the little, um, uh, which I mentioned earlier on, the little chatteries around the side, not the main dome. They've got new, newly made, but correctly newly made blue tiles, um, which also look a little bit strange and take a bit of getting used to. But, um, but I mean, I do think it's probably a good thing they've been done. But, it's, it's very difficult to, to sort of get it right, I think, because um, you know, people who go to old buildings want them to look old. They don't want them to look like sort of modern wedding cakes or something. <laughs> but um, um, at the same time, I think the Aga Khan Foundation has done a very good job of um, doing the research properly and trying to make it very um, correctly done. Thank you, Arthur, for this lovely talk. That picture you showed of that building in Bidar, which half of it you said blew up in an explosion. Yes. You know, looking at the sky behind that picture was the exact blue that they've used in all the tile work. Yes. And that's when you could really imagine how it would have looked like a fenestration or something. So I think yes. that picture really explained it well. Yes, I think and so. I don't think I've ever noticed the sky so blue 
as really that core cool was. Very lucky Thank you for that. Because it's been a great problem um, taking pictures for the book with the daily smog, you know, and the morning you have to wait till about lunchtime before you get any colour in the sky at all. And uh, so that's, that's quite a problem for a photographer, especially not a professional photographer too. Um, hi, thank you for the talk. I noticed a preference for the colors blue, yellow, mostly, in at least the presentation that you showed. So I was wondering if it's a technical reason or if there was some sort of color yes. symbology going on. Yes, I mean, the cobalt and copper, which are the two main elements to produce the turquoise and the deep blue, um, they are, I mean, they're both more common and technically much easier to achieve. And so there's a definite logic to why the other colors came in a little bit later. Um, so um, I, think, I think, you know, it was obviously a new technology. Um, well, I say it was a new technology in India, but in fact, we do have evidence that glazing pottery existed well before the arrival of Islam. But, um, but it was quite limited and not really tiles. It was mostly pots and smaller objects. Um, and um, in the Kushan period, you get um, glazed paving um, slabs as well. But definitely blue and, and dark blue and light blue are the, are the colors that are most easy to achieve. Um, thank you, Arthur. That was a really illuminating um, talk. Um, I have a question um, because you said rightly that um, tiles and uh, in ceramic tiles were not native to India as an art form. Um, there are so many material constraints, and of course, terracotta is widely available, but when we're talking about um, chemicals that we use to glaze, um, they're not always available in the centers where we see these monuments now. So um, when these rulers set up, um, you know, the, the factories and kilns and workshops, um, did they, do you know if uh, we have a record of them bringing over these glazes or were they sourced um, locally? And um, to your knowledge, do any of these centers still exist in any shape or form? So the latter question, I think, I think mostly not. Um, there, there are very few, I mean, I think the only place where we've got a continuing tradition um, is in the Indus region. Um, but um, they definitely, um, specialists were brought in with the, um, with, with, during the Sultanate period, um, specialists in, in all sorts of aspects of ceramic decoration, whether it was painting or um, preparing the glazes. Um, and I think, um, I mean, of course, um, I mean, there is a strong tradition of um, ceramic tiling of buildings in India quite separate of the glazing. You know, we get um, molded, sculptured um, relief tiles, which I haven't really talked about today, but um, um, so, so it's not a completely alien concept of putting ceramic um, attachments on a building. Um, but it's definitely true, yes, that um, on the technical side, specialists were brought in from, from elsewhere, and there are some um, rather isolated bits of documentation to, as evidence, um, certainly with Mandu and Bidar, um, we, do, we do have a little bit of evidence, but not a great deal. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. Uh, it brought a curiosity to my mind that among the tiles, where the ones which are used for, um, what shall I say, Islamic calligraphy, would it be a different technique? Because mostly the floral and the geometric one are repetitive. But when it's part of a script, where it is fixed one after the other, but it's not repetitive, is that a more laborious process, or is it a different technique yes, altogether? It's, it's very laborious. I mean, that huge inscription you saw in Bidar on the madrasa, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's all made up of, um, of little pieces. Um, so very laborious indeed, and especially where there's no repetition. So I mean, there's no way around the work involved, and it was a very 
um, slow and complicated process. And it, you can see immediately why the, there was great appeal to um, painted tiles because it was so much easier to produce. And you could do the physical manufacturing of the tile in a repetitive manner, just producing lots of square pieces and then you were freer to paint in a sort of non-repetitive way, as you liked. So would they uh, kind of place them or write them or, or I, they, I don't know? They, they would have, there would have been, I mean, with those monuments in um, Bidar, there were designers as well as ceramic specialists. So the designer would come in, you had specialist calligraphers to design the uh, um, calligraphic frieze and then it would be done on a, on a sort of template, and, yes. um, and then they would cut pieces to fit on the template, and then face them face down, very complicated, because it would all have been back to front anyway, um, and then put the mortar on, and then put this panel up on the wall. Yes. But it was very, yes. So they won't task. be mass produced or anything, or, 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 there, there or an each figure the, what uh, they could, is one style? What they could mass produce would be the, the, the ceramic pieces which are then cut but so the the actual pieces that are going to be cut could be mass produced well i say mass produced in molds they could be done in quite a repetitive way but once you've got this colored piece that you want to cut up that all has to be done manually Thank and so you. there's no repetition Um, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I have another question. Yeah. So um, my question was related to the people who were commissioning the uh, monuments in the first place. Um, what was their status in society? Were they royal? Uh, are they royal builds or were they of wealthy they chieftains? Were, they were, I, I mean, the, the great um, noble monuments, obviously, they were people very close to the ruling family. But other important characters at court, I mean, for example, um, you know, those sarais I was talking about on the trunk road in Punjab, um, they were usually built by sort of people very connected, but not actually royal themselves. They were sort of um, courtiers. Um, so the tradition of ceramic tile ware was not used in royal uh, builds, or is it just we don't have evidence of it? I mean, if you could generalize, I mean, during the noble period, um, the royal buildings were much more predominantly stone, <laughs> marble, and carving, and inlay. Um, it's not 100% the case, but that's the preference. Whereas, for example, in the hall, the Wazir Khan Mosque, which is completely tiled, it wasn't built by the noble, noble period, but not, not actually built by them. Okay, thank you so much. Um, tomorrow 